Well, I brought along a few notes because I got, you know, some stories and I want to make sure that you don't miss out on a single one of them, eh? Um, okay, I was kind of looking at the agenda. So where do I fit in the agenda? And I'm looking, oh, it's like right before lunch. Well, that's a pretty good time, right? Um, kind of reminds me, though, you know, with the kind of um, feast that we've already had here, both last night and this morning, that I'm kind of like a corpse at an Irish wake. Everybody's very quiet. Well, you don't expect a lot from me, but you can't start the party without me, right? <laughs> so that's, um, and you know, this is not my customary sort of uh, environment for delivering a presentation. It's typically a classroom environment, has a big clock right in front of me so that I don't dare miss, you know, my, my exit announcement. You know, the audience is typically texting and doing a variety of other things, and typically hate as soon as I bring out the cell phone jammer. Um, they, they, they typically don't appreciate me doing that, but, you know, I'll, I'll try pretty much anything, right? Um, you notice I can be a little bit of a fast talker. That's one of my kind of MOs. I kind of believe in, you know, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. And, you know, at my age, that's a very, very handy uh, piece of activity. So, you know, don't mind. And as well, you know, uh, centrifugal force is a huge value when it comes to actually, you know, getting this body into motion. So on that note, I want to certainly thank Alma for the opportunity to be here, you know, and their funding of our project uh, gave us an opportunity to leverage. We have a Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada five-year grant for the RFID lab. And so that kind of uh, fit very nicely with what we're doing in this particular project. So I'm not also, uh, by the way, a caveat, I'm not the artist here, all right? I never did pass art in high school. I got a C because I was on the hockey team. So um, I have to thank one of my guys in the lab for drawing me these absolutely gorgeous pictures. So we're certainly, again, this, I'm sure you all recognize this picture. You know exactly what that is. And there's been a migration, certainly, in the concept of animal identification. Familiar with a management tag, again, you know, got to start, they always say, start with what they know and then take them to what they don't know. So I'm starting with something that I believe you're all very familiar with. And certainly not unfamiliar with that picture either, all right? So now the next thing we're hoping to do is we're planning to add another little bit of, you know, uh, creative jewelry, you know, to our nice little uh, animal here, right? So we're going to add a third tag to a lot of animals over the next a uh, few months and into a year, and pretty soon I believe that this animal is going to look like this. All right? It's actually, that's exactly what it's going to be able to do. All right? So we all, most of us probably in our pocket, in our backpack, somewhere in here, we have one of those little devices. All right? They're very handy. They've grown over the years. They started out with just, you know, a little bit of memory, but they continue to grow, and we believe that you know, the ear of the animal is going to be able to do exactly that as well, that it's going to just continue to grow um, with the ability to basically put information on there whenever we need to. So what are we going to talk about today? Again, I talked a little bit about the thanks that we have to the, the project. And again, I want to make sure that I don't miss a single story, so you'll hear me kind of rustling some paperwork up here. Um, most of the speakers, both last night and this morning, all talked about a supply chain. Well, and, and indeed, this is a supply chain. And in our lab, that's all we work with. We work with somebody's supply chain. Somebody has an asset of some kind that they're trying to track, they're trying to trace that particular asset. So when I talk to oil companies and I tell them that, you know, cows and beef animals are assets, you know, they like kind of stick their head up and like, well, what are you talking about? Well, it's, it's an asset. may not be an asset to, to them, but it's certainly an asset to the people in this room. And so how do we look after that environment? How do we look after those assets? And how do we do that in an efficient environment? So as well, since it's coming up to lunch, and I've noticed that we've done two of the three R's, right? So there's been some reading. There's been some writing. I've noticed that. I've done a bit of that myself. So we can't very well go to lunch without a little bit of arithmetic. So I thought I should throw in a little bit of arithmetic just prior to us going for lunch. So I'm going to do that in a bit. Obviously talk about what we're doing in our project. And 
you know, I'm sure somebody out there will give me an ahem if I kind of run a little bit over time, and I will indeed attempt not to. So this is the technology that we currently use in the industry, right? It's a low frequency RFID tag, and you know, it has certain parameters, has certain capabilities, has a variety of, it has a numbering scheme. You know, again, I'm very mathematical, you know, has a certain amount of bits, how many numbers are available for Canada. And in a perfect world, if we could put animals, you know, in order, in a very, very nice, organized fashion, which I've not actually seen on any of my field visits so far, all right, that we could actually read 10 tags in a single second if we could do it absolutely perfectly. However, the typical environment, you know, on our visits to, you know, to feedlots and to auction markets is that they can read about one animal per second. So if I go and do a little bit more math here, and bear with me, and if you nod over, that's fine. I'll assume that your nodding head then is in agreement with what I'm saying, all right? So, you know, the typical read area for an antenna in, a, in that environment is about, let's say it's two feet wide. So we got an animal moving through there, let's say he's moving at about five miles an hour. All right, so if we do the math, the animal is in the read zone for about a quarter of a second. All right, so for a quarter of a second, that animal with its ear tag is being able to be read. Now, if you take a look at the flashing lights on a you know, panel reader, it's on for about half a second and it's off for about half a second. It's on for half a second and it's off for half a second. Is it's trying to engage a tag and it's trying to listen for a tag. So a little bit of math, you see that, okay, so half a second, that's you know 500 milliseconds using my engineering mathematics. All right, the animal is in the read zone for a quarter of a second. So if it's off for half a second, we're not actually guaranteed that one single panel would actually read a tag, which is why when you go to some of the environments, you see four panels on a side. Some people confuse left and right, so tags are not necessarily always on the same side of an animal's head, and it takes a variety of hardware to therefore make sure that we can read that. So if we take and move ahead one step and say, okay, so how could we do that differently? Are there other technologies that might enable us to do that? As well, a low frequency tag, it's written once at the factory. We can read it many times, but we can't overwrite the information that's on there. And of course, we certainly don't want to mess with the ID number for that animal. So if we take a look at this ultra high frequency that we're experimenting with, a little bit of, again, conversation starter at parties. I'm sure all of you would like to use some of this. You know, at some time in the future, when you're entertaining guests in your home, feel free to, all right? So, in UHF, the perfect read sequence, we can actually read 800 tags in a single second. You say, okay, well, that's pretty exciting. And the typical environment, we can read about 500 quite, quite easily in pretty much any environment. So if we take the exact same setup as we had in the low frequency environment, all right? So again, we've got about a two foot wide read zone. UHF would be typically wider, but let's keep it the same. Um, We've got an animal, again, moving roughly five, five miles an hour past that particular um, area. We actually have a chance to read that tag 186 times during its quarter of a second window through that read zone. Now, in order to read a tag, I don't have to read it 186 times. I only need to read it once. But we have the chance to read it that many times. So, what are we doing with that? Well, we're simply trying to leverage that capability to improve you know, the read area and the read, um, the read accuracy of animals that pass by that simple setup and simple environment. I haven't actually mentioned that the cost of doing those in the two different uh, frequency bands, so at low frequency, that might cost us about $50,000 to do that. At UHF, we're in the neighborhood of five to $6,000 to be able to do that. So there are some significant advantages. The tag, as you saw with my little picture on the ear there, there's user memory in the tag, all right? So it can be written to. We can write a certain amount of information to that particular tag. For the tag and the inlay that we're using in our project, we chose one that has 512 bits. Sounds like, you know, boy, that's not very much memory. 
For those of us that pack gigabits around in our little watch pockets, you know, just 512 bits doesn't seem like a lot, but if we use it efficiently, we can do quite a bit of activity with that. So most of you, you know, I see a fair uh, amount of Wrangler jeans in the audience, and most of you may not realize that, but a lot of those products are already RFID tagged. There's currently about 200 billion items of apparel on the globe, on the shelf, in stores for sale. And currently about 1% of those items are already RFID tagged. So you've got about 2 billion items of apparel being tagged annually. So a year ago I reported to one of the groups that there's about uh, 2 billion tags that were sold in 2010. Well, this year going to exceed already 4 billion UHF tags being sold globally. And again, obviously you can see the big gorilla certainly is the, you know, the, uh, the apparel industry. So there's a lot of adoption for UHF applications. All right? If you took a look at 100% of the RFID applications around the globe, 96% of them are with UHF technology. Yes, LF is a technology. It's been here since the 80s when Area 51, I think they're still looking for some of those barrels of nuclear waste that they tagged with LF RFID tags. I'm not sure if they'll ever find them. Um, but the technology has been around and it works. I'm not, I certainly would never dispute the fact that it works. But I believe that there's some other technologies that will provide additional use cases uh, for, for this particular industry. So what are we actually trying to do with our ALMA-funded project? Well, we're certainly trying to test UHF RFID systems and applications in the beef industry. I'm a great, I was a great believer that before I got involved with the beef industry that I always said the technology with the most acronyms wins. And I always thought I was running a pretty close, maybe second or third you know, on the global sort of scale of things. But once I've kind of gotten involved with the beef industry, I realized that I'm just, a, I'm just a beginner when it comes to acronyms. So, you know, I got to certainly tip my hat, you know, to, the, to your industry for acronyms. And uh, what else are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to develop a UHF cattle tag that meets retention, application requirements of the industry and its regulations. So a little bit about us uh, up at the lab, we have a mobile command post that we use for going out and doing field projects. We've had this since uh, 2008. Uh, it's a very handy little critter. It's got basically wireless internet. It's a mobile hotspot. So any of the field locations that we've been to, any of our devices, any of our readers that are within sort of a thousand feet of this command post have access to the internet, have access to our web server up at the lab where we keep all of our database information. Just another little peek at its inside again. So any of those who are a little bit interested in technology, I'll guarantee you when you come to the lab and you walk across the threshold, your face will break into a grin. When you see all of the uh, pieces of hardware technology that we have, you know, you will, you will simply not want to go home. I usually have to kind of, you know, do a little bit of sweeping around 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon to make sure that the guys and the gals in the lab actually go home because they're just having so much fun. I can't imagine why. So yeah, just again, another peek of what we have inside the lab. Uh, peek at some of the hardware. Some of it you saw in the Alma video if you were watching earlier. So we're not building a lot of what we're doing for commercialization. Primarily, we're building what we're building for our project. Having been out to the field, you know, been out to the ranches, been out to the feedlots, been out to the auction markets, been out to both of the processing plants, both at Brooks and at High River, basically taking a look at, well, what are we going to need to compare this technology, to showcase it, to do a proof of concept, and so that's what we've built. So here's, again, a typical reader that we've built for our project. Um, again, it's it's battery powered, it can run on the field on its own for about three days without us going back and recharging it or collecting the battery. And it's uh, again, not a significant investment. This one that I'm showing you is kind of, we had to create a 16 foot wide alley in the lab. A little, not too tough to do outside, but a little bit tough to kind of do inside as we were kind of looking at this 16 foot wide alley 
uh, seven animals abreast 20 miles an hour to see if we can read all the tags. I've had students volunteer to run through the alley carrying a tag, but no student yet has volunteered to run through the alley actually wearing a tag. So, you know, hopefully in, in my next report, I'll be able to report success in that aspect of my project as well. Again, antennas are pretty simple. The higher you go in frequency, again, don't want to, uh, you know, exhaust you with all of my technical facts at one time, but the higher you go in frequency, the less wire, the less hardware, the smaller an antenna can become that does exactly the same task. So this particular reader is the one that we've designed to go out to the processing plant. It's got a small sensor on it to detect a carcass going by, and you can see the variety of light stack options just to simply show uh, whether or not it's actually being able to read a tag as it's going by as we get ready to retire them at the end of our project. So here's our 16-foot wide alley set up in the lab. Again, it's a pretty temporary mobile sort of a platform that we've used in a variety of different settings already to test out our technology. Uh, so we created a few uh, software events already up in the lab. Again, one of our big areas where we're going to be tagging animals obviously is at a variety of the feedlots and trying to make something that is as seamless as possible to fit in with what they do. How do they do their business? How long is an animal in the squeeze chute? Can we get him tagged? What can we do? So we're actually taking a variety of information to create, again, a little bit of redundancy because we don't actually know yet for a fact whether some of the tags we put on are going to fall off. So we're taking the actual CCIA tag number that's already on the animal, most of them have a management tag number. We're taking the GPS location from where, where we are located. You see a variety of other information. And all of that, we're writing it onto the tag. All right, so we could actually read that tag sometime later with a handheld reader, and we could actually determine the exact location where it got tagged. And again, working in that environment, they want to know, OK, the red light is on, so we want to make sure that they don't release the animal until we're finished actually writing that information to the tag and then we can be we have a again a little green light visual indicator for the squeeze operator shoot operator to let him know that we're done with the animal as well so hope we're hoping to kind of make our visits there as unintrusive as possible we want we certainly want to make sure they know we were there but we want to make sure that we fit within the business that they're doing because if they're going to tag 250 animals with us there, we want to make sure that doesn't take four or five days to complete, because I'm sure that there'd be a little bit of muttering under somebody's breath. Um, hardware at UHF, very, very flexible. All right, so we can basically set up, as you saw, the little archway or the alleyway that we had set up. It has four antennas. We can basically totally configure that. We can totally design how big of a read zone do we want. Do we want it to be very small? Do we want it to be very large? Very, very user-friendly user settings that we've created, again, for our environment. And here's just an example of the software reading tags, some of the uh, systems that we're going to have. Once we've tagged the animals, going back a second time, okay, well, we know how many animals we're expecting on our second visit. We tagged 225 when we were here, you know, a month and a half ago. Well, we hope that we're going to see them all. So we basically have an application set up that will let me the user know exactly when I've reached 100% of my success. Going back to what I said earlier, I, probably a little bit hard to see the text there in the very bottom, but we read a couple of those tags over a period of about four seconds. And so even in this, and this is our lab environment where we probably have seven or 8,000 tags that are in there and periodically being read, we were able to read some of these tags 122 times in four seconds. So in this case, roughly about 30 times a second for each one of those tags. So this is not a single file environment. This is where we just have tags just piled up everywhere. All right? And that's our lab is dirty. I call it very dirty because we have probably eight or nine readers running at one time. They're all trying to, you know, compete for the airspace. This technology works around something called listen before talk. So every reader is very polite. It listens to see, is any other reader out there using a channel? Is it using any of the airspace? If not, well, then I'll use it. If not, you go ahead, use that. I'll move to another channel. So it's a very, very polite 
system, all right? So again, just some of the things that we can do. We can configure our settings of the reader on the fly. We are recording the current temperature in the, I don't know when it was actually 23 in the lab, must have had a misfunction with the air conditioning because I think it's been running since last November, the air conditioner. So it was a little bit chilly up there this winter. I came in the morning and everybody's wearing a parka and I'm like, are we going outside? No, 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 we're testing in here because it's cold enough, right? So, so where, where's our progress? I can see the time is slipping away from me, so I'll try to, you know, scurry on without sounding like I'm going too fast. We basically have had opportunities now to prove all of these applications, our tagging application, our reading application. Obviously, one of the stages that's going to be very important is retention. Are some of these tags going to stay in, and how are we going to prove that? So that's an application I've got the guys in the lab working on. We've had a chance to test all of the readers and antennas, obviously taking our mobile field lab out to a variety of the locations. During last November, during the big windstorm on Highway 2, we almost became a statistic, but very thankfully we were able to get back into Calgary without becoming one. So a picture of a couple of prototypes. Those of you that have been out to see the little poster board out in the foyer, have already seen a couple of these, so again, have taken you know, some existing, um, existing tag structures and see, well, how could we look at creating some new ones, not however in LF, but in a UHF format. So a couple of them, some are two-piece. We've created a few one-piece RFID tags. Some of you, again, have seen this out there in the, in the foyer, and this is what it would look like when it's actually attached, all right? So it basically folds up around the ear, ear top, ear bottom, we're not fussy. So if you're not fussy with where you tag them, we're not too fussy with where we read them. And again, a, a third one that we're looking at uh, basically putting into production. So a little bit on use cases. I see I got the uh, lunch hour sign, so I'm sure that all of you are hoping that my last word in my presentation is amen. All right, so that you're ready to step out for lunch. Uh, so yeah, so we basically have been through about 100,000 flex tests on those tags to hopefully make sure that they don't fall off or break off. We've done a 10-day ammonia vapor test on them. Again, tested them with a raw inlay, an inlay in a small PVC um, laminate, and then obviously in the over-molded environment. So I'll just kind of throw up some of these use cases here so you can kind of see what they are. Um, our cohorts down at the University of Arkansas RFID lab, when they started working in the retail apparel industry, were asked to come and look at, okay, we want to do RF, we want to use this RFID for this. They came away with 60 more use cases for RFID in their industry. And wherever we've gone, we have seen opportunities for other environments and other ways to use RFID. Not necessarily the current RFID technology, but certainly UHF provides a large um, additional framework of use cases for it. So again, and most of these I throw up here simply to challenge and whet your imagination, all right? Because wherever I go and I talk about use cases, someone says, well, if you can do that, what about this? So if somewhere, you know, during the course of this uh, today and over the, you know, uh, coming up weeks, I mean, if you come up with some use cases, I'm sure that there's a way for us to, you know, certainly incorporate those and start experimenting with them. And so, yeah, so here was just one simple example. Again, at a water bunk, pretty easy for us to determine with a list of animals that are in there, whether or not an animal is actually showing up to that water bunk. If you have a period of time, maybe four hours, six hours, eight hours, whatever that interval might be, you could immediately get an alert to tell you that while you have this particular tag, this particular animal has not been anywhere near the water bunk in that particular amount of time. So again, just one example that I'm throwing out there. And you can see this is actually my artwork. <laughs> you can tell quite a bit of the difference from some of the earlier pictures that I showed you. Um, another one, certainly listening to people talk about, you know, the transport and the moving of animals is we believe we can create an electronic proof of delivery as well for when animals are delivered, when they're picked up. And of course at the end, going to be the processing plant, it's full of automation. And if nothing else, RFID loves automation. All right? So 
here's who I am, there's where I live, and feel free to come and visit me. The lab is always open for visitors, and we're pretty uh, love having guests. So thank you very much.